Uh, so also, I want to call to your attention that I am, this uh, topic is something that's included. Uh, so this is the historical point, number one. Uh, now, up at the top of this slide, um, I tell, I, I quote the uh, definition of p-value that is given, there was this recent uh, a statement about p-values and caution about their use uh, three years ago published by the American Statistical Association. Uh, some people have been questioning whether a professional academic association should be telling people what to think. Uh, probably it shouldn't have, but uh, there was a lot of concern about abuse of p-values and they issued this statement. At the beginning of the statement, they defined a p-value. Uh, and I'll read it. A p-value is the probability under a specified statistical model that a statistical summary of the data, for example, the sample mean difference between two compared groups, or it might be uh, the difference between two proportions, would be equal to or more extreme than its observed value. Now, in fact, that's a very complicated idea. It's, uh, if you've not been using it lately, uh, it's hard to get your head around. People that don't teach statistics all the time, I think, um, uh, you know, you can get confused very easily. If I can. So why is the definition so complicated? Uh, and the answer is that it, it started with something much simpler. Um, if you go back 200 years to the early 1800s, uh, statisticians were estimating things already. And they were giving the probable error for what they estimated. Now, you may not have heard the term probable error. Maybe it's not a very good name. Uh, people have criticized uh, the name probable error. The probable error is like the standard deviation. In fact, it is two thirds of the standard deviation. Why did people choose this particular number? And the answer is uh, there's a probability of 50 50 that you're farther away or closer than that. Uh, so that's a little diagram of the normal curve. And, um, you know, you're within one standard deviation two thirds of the time, but you're within one probable error 50% of the time. So that's why they started with this idea of probable error. And for centuries, people did not use, or at least for a century, they didn't use standard deviation, they used probable error. Uh, and uh, let me ask a question uh, of our audience. Could each of you uh, write a chat response? Have you ever heard of the probable error before? So a yes or no. I'll see if I can see your responses. So yes or no, uh, did you ever hear of the term probable error before. One student says no, another student says no, another student says no, uh, two more no's. Uh, interesting, uh, everybody says no. Uh, you know, if you were a uh, physicist, you might still see it because when physicists write down some number plus or minus, I think they still use that probable error. Uh, so, or maybe a standard, but I think sometimes it's still the probable error, plus or minus. Uh, um, uh, so, the idea when people start with these problems, and sometimes there was also another system they used uh, besides probable error, which is two thirds of the standard deviation. Uh, they also used something that was uh, actually bigger than the standard deviation. It was the square root of the standard deviation. So 1.4 times the standard deviation. Some authors used that, but they didn't use the standard deviation. That only started around 1900. But they were, they, uh, and they called that a, some authors called that a modulus. Uh, so anyhow, they, anyway, the idea was that you would, you figured you would, uh, be so many probable errors or so many moduli from the within, uh, you know, uh, some bounds uh, of the estimate. And the first 
statistician that popularized this, I think, was a famous mathematician named Fourier, Joseph Fourier. Uh, and he said, well, uh, you can be sure that the truth is within six probable errors. So that's about four, you know, probable errors two thirds of a standard deviation. So six probable errors is four standard deviations. That's a lot. And the probability of being within four standard deviations is less than one hundredth of 1%. That's 10, one in 10,000 times. And actually it's more like one in 20,000 times. You know, uh, only one in 20,000 times would you be more than six probable errors away. So they had a pretty high standard of practical certainty. Well, Fourier was working with a census numbers from the uh, entire country of France. So he had big numbers. So, you know, uh, and he was imagining that you had independence, which is maybe dubious, but he was using big numbers. And so he said, oh, six probable errors. Uh, you can be sure. Uh, and then people started using smaller data sets. Uh, so in the 1830s, they started saying, well, maybe four probable errors, you could be sure. Uh, that's a half of 1%. Uh, two standard deviations. Uh, two, excuse me, 2.8 standard deviations. As actually, I told you that sometimes they used a square root of two times a standard deviation. So if you took two of those, you got 2.8 standard deviations. Um, and so in the 1830s, they were using that. Some statisticians think we should go back to that, go back to instead of a 5% error, uh, we should only tolerate a one half of 1%, like Poisson did in the 1830s. But by the 1890s, uh, when uh, the English statisticians started using biological data, they had even smaller sample sizes. So they said, well, we'll just do three probable errors, uh, which is 5% error. Uh, we can be pretty sure that, you know, it's within two standard deviations, uh, which is three probable errors. So the idea was that your confidence interval is some, the estimate plus or minus some number of probable errors. I wrote here estimate plus. Uh, I should have written estimate plus or minus uh, K times the probable error. They didn't use the word confidence interval at first, but this was the idea they were using for a century. Okay, I have another question for everybody. Am I talking too fast? Yes or no? Please answer me with your chat. Am I talking okay. too fast? No, no, no. Well, three students said no. Uh, another one says, oh, okay. So most of you think I'm okay. All right. Uh, so confidence interval equals estimate plus or minus, uh, not the plus, but plus or minus. And the probable error is two thirds of a standard deviation. So the common example they were all interested in, you know, the, um, uh, the play example that they always used was the birth ratio. There are more boys than girls born, but is the number the same in different places? Uh, a lot of these statisticians were French, so they were interested. Is the birth, is the proportion of boys different in the provinces than in Paris? They were interested in that. Or what about legitimate and illegitimate births? There were a lot of illegitimate children. Um, uh, that was a big deal in those days, whether your parents were married, as you know. And... Uh, so where, where were the boy, you know, were the rates different? Uh, so there's all kinds of questions you could ask like that. So that was an interesting example people worked with. But then they got into medical statistics and they were arguing already in the early 1800s about gallstones. Uh, people had a new, some doctor had a new way of dealing with gallstones. It was widely adopted. Uh, I assume you know uh, what a gallstone is. Um, uh, maybe somebody. Uh, does anybody know the name in Chinese for gallstone? If you know the Chinese name for gallstone, then uh, send a chat uh, uh, with that. Um, 
Okay, there it is. Uh, someone, does everybody see the, does everybody see the chat when I see it? Does everybody see it? Yes. Okay, so you all see the Chinese name for Gulf Stone. Uh, so there was arguments about that. Um, and uh, so people were interested in two proportions. You had an estimate P1 hat and P2 hat. And the difference, P1 hat minus P2 hat, the question was, is that zero? Is there any difference between the two treatments, between this way of, you know, do, is, are gallstones uh, uh, dissolved by one method better than another, or more often than another? Or are they really equal, or practically equal? So you've got the formula for the standard deviation. They use the probable error, but we'll talk about standard deviation. So the question is, uh, are you more than 2.8 standard deviations from zero? And uh, for instance, there was one guy that wrote a book in 1840, a whole book about medical statistics full of recipes. And he said, look, this is the way it is. If your estimate, if the observed difference between the two rates is more than 2.8 standard deviations from zero, then you can say the one treatment is better. If it's less than 2.8, you say nothing. You can't say anything. It was yes or no. Uh, either you've got an answer that one is better than the other, and you can say which one, or else you can't say anything. And he really underlined that. You can't say anything. Don't go saying almost. Uh, almost doesn't count. Uh, if it's uh, 2.7 standard deviations, you can't say anything. Of course, so that's what his, he said in his book, and that was the official statistician uh, line already back in 1840, almost 200 years ago. But, you know, people don't like that. They want to say, well, if it's 2.7, it's almost, even if it's, uh, you know, 1.9, it's almost, yeah, it's not a half of 1%, but maybe it's 1% or 5%. It's still evidence. You want to measure the strength of evidence. So what is the probability corresponding to the confidence interval that just touches zero? How, how, you know, how big would we make, have to make that error probability to get a significant result, uh, quote, unquote? That's the p-value. So I think, uh, I guess I have a picture on the next. Uh, looking for these almost significant results or searching for significant, they didn't use the word significance, but they were doing the same thing. They were looking for significant results. And uh, that was already a problem. One of the big problems that the statisticians are talking about and not just statisticians and you know, in medicine and psychology, this has really hit experimental psychology hard. They're really in a, feel like they're in a crisis and it's an issue in medicine, a lot of fields uh, and in accounting and finance literature. Uh, people are saying, well, you know, everybody is searching for that 5% and then when they find it, they publish it, but they aren't telling you how many things they tried. You know, if you say, oh, this could only happen by accident or by chance one time in 20, but you've looked in 20 places already, then it clearly doesn't have the same meaning. And this was already being debated and criticized in the 1840s and 1830s. So there's nothing, you know, the Bible says the uh, Christian, the King, you know, King Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. So. This is the development of this idea and talks about when the word significance was brought. Um, and, um, you know, the word significance wasn't used uh, back at the beginning, but it was the same thing. Uh, so here is uh, uh, my second point about, already said it in a way, that, uh, and, the one of the most depressing aspects, even the te even people teaching statistics mess it up. Not to mention the doctors uh, who use statistics. They 
they often misinterpret p-values. And there's a couple of uh, papers written about this. Some experiments where, you know, surveys rather, where people tested the teachers and the teachers got it wrong. So there's two misinterpretations. One misinterpretation is when you take a p-value less than 5% as saying more than it does, saying really it's really conclusive evidence, uh, and it isn't uh, conclusive. Uh, so that's one misinterpretation. And the other interpretation is when you say, well, if the p-value is much larger than 5%, uh, that is evidence for the null hypothesis, uh, and that may not be true at all. may not be true at all. If the v-value is bigger than 5, excuse me, bigger than 5%, say it's 50% instead of 5%, even if the p-value is 50%, it may not be evidence for the null hypothesis at all. Uh, this, is the, this is what uh, Professor Creedy and his colleagues write about. Uh, it's not as common a mistake, but it turns out that, unfortunately, we can all cry about this. Unfortunately, you find this mistake pretty often in the accounting review. Uh, that's a distressing story. Uh, Professor Creedy calls the p-value bigger than 5% a null outcome. This is not a standard terminology in statistics textbooks. Uh, but it's his term. Uh, okay. Uh, here are the uh, true-false questions that people ask teachers and uh, people using STAT about p-values. I used to ask my students, well, in the last few years, I have been asked my students to answer these questions. Your graduate students don't get them right, and your colleagues don't get them right. Uh, a year ago, when I gave this lecture in, um, you know, a lecture like this, um, uh, in this survey uh, class, um, I was in the room, of course, and I handed out this, these questions and asked people to answer them on the spot. And as I recall, nobody got them all right. Uh, I didn't hand them out. I figured you guys, if you had time, you would get these, some of the answers. You, you would get them right, I hope. Uh, and maybe you'd also ask the previous students and uh, they would tell you. So I didn't bother to embarrass you by trying to show that you would get them wrong. But the fact is, um, this is one of those two false questions where all the answers are false. So uh, if you get a p-value, the first one on the left-hand side of the slide, if you get a p-value less than 5%, does that show the null hypothesis is false? No, it doesn't. Does it show the null hypothesis is probably false? No, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't show even that it's probably false, which is very against the intuition that our students are taught, actually. We, we give them the idea that it, it says that, that a low p-value tells you the hypothesis is probably false. Uh, but the way mathematical probability is defined, it is not true that we have established that there is a probability less than that's very small. The probability for the null hypothesis is very small. Uh, people might feel that's that is uh, paradoxical, but uh, that's the way statisticians think about it. They aren't really assigning a probability to the null hypothesis, and they certainly aren't necessarily assigning a probability that is small. Uh, if you're a Bayesian, you would be willing to assign probabilities to the null hypothesis. But in that case, um, uh, you uh, wouldn't uh, necessarily get a small probability for the null hypothesis just because the p-value is small. Now, I just use the word Bayesian. 
and I should write it, have written it down or spelled it. Uh, just I assume I'm assuming uh, that that so here's so on the right hand side um, again you have a small p value and uh, the question is what have you learned from that uh, have you absolutely disproved the null hypothesis no have you found a probability for it no uh, have you um, uh, proved uh, uh, all this stuff is no. You can't deduce the probability. That's number four. Uh, if you reject it, uh, uh, you can't, um, you don't know the probability that you'd be wrong. Uh, and also, uh, you can't be sure that you would get the same result or you don't even have a uh, probability for getting the same result if you do it again. So all those are false and usually people, even people that teach stat will think, well, one of them has to be true and we'll give an, a true for one of them. Very discouraging that. Uh, uh, so this topic uh, about misinterpreting low p-values has been discussed quite a bit in the last 10 years in the accounting literature and Professor Creedy and his colleagues on page four of their big paper, they give these citations. So it's not something new. Uh, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, the statisticians uh, have proposed all kinds of things. They said, well, we should just teach it better. Yeah, sure. Uh, we should use confidence intervals instead of tests. That's a very common, and yes, it's true. Uh, yes, I agree, but People, as I said, they started with the confidence intervals and then they got the tests. Uh, I don't think using the confidence intervals is not going to solve the problem. Uh, talk about practical significance instead of statistical significance. Yes. Uh, do the Bayesian uh, stuff instead of, uh, instead of p-values. Um, uh, or use Bayes factors. And I quote a, um, some of my colleagues, uh, Professor Gelman is one of my younger colleagues at Columbia in the stat department, who's uh, very well known in psychology. Uh, <clears throat> he says, none of these are gonna work. Uh, we just have to be more willing to accept uncertainty. Uh, that's there. Okay. Uh, um, so the second mistake, now I'm in the second mistake, and this is the one that Professor Creedy has been writing about. Uh, people sometimes think, I hear I wrote often, maybe I should wrote sometimes, sometimes take a p-value larger than 5% as evidence for the null hypothesis. This isn't as common, but as I said, it turns out to be common in the accounting review, uh, sadly. So there's this official statement. I thought I should list in 2016, what did, this, what did the American Statistical Association? There's six statements. Uh, okay, most of them sound more or less agree with them. Uh, the, the third one is maybe not quite convincing to me. Sometimes people do use p-values as a threshold for decisions. And uh, there are situations where uh, that's probably necessary or useful. Uh, so you could say, well, they, in those situations, they have other evidence or other information that tells them this is a good way to do it. So maybe they're not basing it only on whether a p-value, see I'm reading the word only in number three. It's number three that I'm uh, criticizing. I don't think, but I basically, I don't think I fully agree with number three, but otherwise uh, all the statements are reasonable. Uh, but you can, Quibble with number three at least, and you can also ask whether the uh, American Statistical Association should be trying to 
tell its members what to think um, or how to use statistics. Uh, and my colleague, Professor Mayo, uh, uh, has written a critique of this. So not everybody is quite on board. Now, there's a uh, question I mentioned earlier that some said, oh, if we just made it harder, instead of 5%, maybe we should make it a half of 1%. Uh, there's a debate about that. And actually, as I mentioned earlier, this would be going back to what uh, some famous mathematicians were doing 100, 200 years ago, Poisson and Gavaret, and they were using a half of 1%. Uh, so a few years ago, in, in 2017, there were there was an article advocating it. There's also a um, uh, one of the articles in the I gave his optional reading by Professor uh, uh, Campbell Harvey. Is it Campbell Harvey or Harvey Campbell? I think it's Campbell Harvey, who was the president of the American uh, Finance Association. Uh, actually argued for it. Uh, but then you've got people arguing that it's not going to help. Uh, and in 2018, there were 50 statisticians that published a paper saying it's not going to help. And probably, you know, it, it would put some people out of business. It's very hard. Some of these psychological experiments, you just, you know, it's just too asking too much. Uh, they really couldn't uh, uh, manage to publish things that way. Uh, but maybe they should be put out of business. That's a big crisis. So it's a debate. Uh, and then there are the statisticians that say, let's, let's get rid of the word statistical significance. Uh, so here's a, um, this was a year ago. A whole bunch of um, uh, famous statisticians and not so famous statisticians 800 of them all together signed a um, opinion piece in the journal Nature saying, let's abandon the entire concept of statistical significance. I put that in quotes. And I gave you the link to it. Uh, Nature, maybe you've heard of the journal Nature. Uh, that's arguably one of the two top science journals uh, you know, there's an American journal with the name Science, and there's a British journal with the name Nature, and they're generally considered the top journals. If you get an article in one of those journals, that's almost good enough for tenure. Uh, so 800 people signed up. This is a cartoon that is in that, uh, used in that, um, uh, in that uh, editorial or commentary, and it shows the statistician uh, putting statistical significance in the storeroom along with a bunch of other uh, bad ideas. Um, okay, so that brings us to Professor Creedy, uh, who um, in uh, 2019 just uh, put out this article, I won't say published because he couldn't get it published, but showing that articles in accounting review often misinterpret non-significant outcomes, which he called null outcomes. Uh, this, this might be a little confusing because it's not, we're not talking about the null hypothesis. We're talking about the result of the test, the outcome of the test. So a null outcome is where you do not reject the null hypothesis. Uh, so, you know, I don't know that the particular, the word null is, is useful here, or it might be a little confusing, but, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, I don't know if he needed to, in, in, to introduce new terminology, but that's what So I asked you to read that two-page article that he published in a journal called Significance. This is not really a journal. It's a magazine for statisticians. Uh, sort of little success stories of statistics published by the Royal Statistical Society and the American Statistical. Uh, 
so it's four statisticians. Professor Creedy is a professor of accounting, uh, but uh, he evidently is very well trained in statistics. And he wrote this article to report to statisticians what's going on in accounting, saying, look how terrible that situation is, how badly the accountants are using statistics. And as a statistician myself, I guess I have to think he's right. Um, so, uh, and he also explained how the editor, what the editor told him when she rejected the paper, uh, that he, his paper for publication in the accounting review. Uh, so the referees didn't like the paper. I guess that's not surprising. It was, they, they were being criticized, probably papers they had published. But he's, she wrote that it is well known that null results are difficult to interpret. Uh, and um, uh, so it's not surprising that people would interpret them differently. And she didn't think that Professor Creedy's paper and the paper of Helium, that is Professor Creedy, well, she didn't think the Creedy et al. paper was much of a contribution. Uh, you know, I, I think I might agree that it wasn't much of a contribution because it was just repeating what statisticians have said for two centuries. Uh, but, um, but to point out that this advice was being ignored so routinely by the journal, I think was an important contribution. Uh, but this is the attitude. I mean, I, you know, can you blame the editor? The editor is about as distinguished as you get. She's a um, emerita uh, chaired professor at Stanford in the business school there, and she was a um, she was at Harvard, and she was a partner in a top firm. Of course, Arthur Anderson doesn't exist now, as you know. She was president of the American he, Chinese Association, as opinionated and old-fashioned as you can think, very bad. No, okay, I. Uh, I was special editor for an issue of, uh, for an article that she didn't understand. I accepted it, and then she overturned me on old basis. She is horrible editor. Sorry about saying that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think you're agreeing with Professor Creedy. So anyway, but it's a sign of, um, I think she was in line with the journal, it sounds like. Uh, and perhaps this is not just about her, but I thought I would mention how important, how, how distinguished she is. So, as I said, um, the philosophy that Creedy et al. is presenting is not new. It's two centuries old. Uh, he's got a little bit, they have a little bit different terminology. Uh, but I mentioned that uh, Jules Gavaret, in his book on medical statistics in 1840, was saying the same thing. He was saying that if uh, no difference is in the confidence interval, you can't say anything about whether there's an effect. Now, uh, Professor Creedy points out that if you have an idea about how big an effect matters, uh, so around zero, you put an interval that's indicated by the red line here. If you put an interval around zero and you say, unless it's outside that interval, unless it's farther from zero than that, no difference here is zero, right? Uh, so if you believe that anything in that interval, red interval, doesn't matter, and your confidence interval is inside it, then you can say, uh, I am confident that there isn't a big enough effect to matter. You can do that. But, you know, unless you can say that, unless you can tell, unless you have made that judgment uh, that differences uh, within your confidence interval don't matter, then you can't just say that because the P value was big, uh, that you're supporting the hypothesis of no difference. No, can't do that. So, uh, Professor Creedy introduces a uh, new term, he calls it MPSD, the minimum practically significant difference. 
So that's my red line. Distance, the red line goes from no distance. Uh, so what did he do? He looked at, he and his colleagues, he had a, I shouldn't just say him because he had, there were six authors and they did a lot of work. They looked at all the articles published in the accounting review over a three year period or, and uh, they said, how many of these articles use p-values? And 113 of them use p-values. And 35 of them reported that at least some of the tests they made had non-significant outcomes. And what did these 35 articles say about the non-significant outcomes? And it turns out that out of the 35 articles, all but two of them misinterpreted the null significant outcomes according to these authors. According to these authors, they should have used broadly neutral language indicating that they were unable to reject the null hypothesis and not saying that the null hypothesis uh, was um, uh, uh, supported. But he said all, you know, basically um, uh, some of the articles even said that the null outcome, that is the failure to reject, supported the null hypothesis. Uh, and um, uh, that was very common in the abstracts, and it's what most often happened in the, um, in the text of the papers. How are you them to work? So I assume meeting recording has resumed, uh, so um, uh, <clears throat> let me talk about uh, uh, ideas for um, uh, replacing, uh, improving PVs. Uh, I didn't mention there are a lot of articles by statisticians on how we could make values more understandable. Unfortunately, what these articles do, almost all of them add something to p-values. In a sense, that's making them more complicated. Uh, and the problem is they're already too complicated. So what I am proposing is actually a completely different idea that replaces p-values with something which I claim is simpler. Now, nothing new feels simpler because it's new. Uh, but I think once we got used to this idea, it would feel simpler and also more general. And that the my replacement is to replace p-values by what I call a betting outcome. Uh, so let's talk about uh, means of betting outcome. Green here. Yellow there. Uh, so this is in this working paper. Uh, the language of betting is a strategy for statistical and scientific communication that is now about a year old, but I completely revised it about six months ago. And I mentioned earlier, I was bragging that it has been nearly accepted, provisionally accepted, minor revisions for being read as a paper of the Royal Statistical Society. So, um, uh, so this idea of betting outcomes. Uh, the idea is that we, we test hypotheses, but also more generally, we test probability forecasts by betting. Uh, so the idea here is that, you know, a, a statistical hypothesis tells the probability for what's going to happen. But nowadays, we have a lot of probabilities that don't from statistical models. They come from all kinds of things. For example, um, uh, we have earnings forecasts. Uh, we have probabilities for weather. Uh, we have probabilities for sports and elections. Um, those are not given really by uh, stable statistical models. So how can we test them? And my idea is, I'm saying, the, the really, in some cases, the really only way to test them is by betting. Uh, this, this, I, these ideas really come out of a book that, well, 
I have been collaborating with my uh, friend Vladimir Loft for 20 years. Uh, we published our first book in 20 years ago in 2001. Uh, this book came out a year ago. It's a book, uh, which is very, it's a very mathematical book. And it really says base the whole idea of probability theory on betting. Uh, but this talk is, is, you know, paper I'm talking about now is gives something more, um, uh, less mathematical, more practical. Uh, there's also another working paper, number 47. Uh, the, the talk I'm now is uh, from number 54, but number 47 is about market efficiency. Uh, so these ideas also apply to understanding market efficiency. So, uh, as I say, often forecasts are not based on statistical models. Uh, they may come from physical models like the probabilities for hurricanes don't come from statistical models in any conventional sense. Uh, they come from uh, 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 differential equation models that, that physicists use. Uh, also, we now have probability forecasts from neural networks, which are not statistical models, uh, in, uh, only in some very weird sense could you call them statistical models. They have millions of parameters which are estimated in uh you know in a very uh in a very uh, non-transparent hidden way so that uh really they look like black boxes uh, and also every forecast might be on a different topic but we can still test by betting uh so here for example is um some of you may be familiar with the website 538.com. Uh, a statistician named Nate Silver uh, launched this website and it was very well known uh, from. Also, mainly forecast sports. Uh, sports um, uh, so in January, these were his. Uh, results for who would come out on top in the uh, National Basketball Association. Uh, he gave a 25, I haven't looked at this more recently, and I don't know if they, I guess they're not, I don't know what's going to happen, whether there's even going to be a, um, uh, uh, <laughs> whether they're going to, are they, are they, well, they aren't playing now. Is the NBA still playing? Does anybody know? I don't follow this. Uh, I don't think so. No, I have they, no idea. Yeah, so we don't know if they're going to fall. But anyway, back in January, a couple of months they are ago, not playing. They are not playing. No, yeah. no professional sport is playing. Yeah, so they I, actually they tested the entire NBA. Uh, yeah. So they are privileged. They get tests, correct? And yeah. about fifteen of the players tested positive. But none yeah. of them seem to be in a catastrophic situation. And that's my mini, mini sample of full population that I'm using to think that there is a large amount of people that are contaminating everyone, but have no symptoms. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, and back in January, they thought there was a 25% chance the Bucks would win, uh, finish on top of the season. Uh, you know, uh, obviously there isn't any, even any answer now. Uh, there isn't any season. Uh, so, you know, the question is, how would you test that? Um, here's another, of course, uh, famous case. Um, the same website, 538.com, I took a screenshot uh, yesterday uh, of their uh, uh, website where they were, you know, predicting who was going to win the Democratic nomination. Sure, you all follow that enough to know that first it was Biden, then it was Sanders, then it was nobody. Uh, nobody would be a it would be a contested convention, and then it was Biden again. Uh, these probabilities going up and down. Elizabeth Chaya, Cho Cho Vasarelai. Uh, did someone say something? Uh, maybe that was at Miklos's house. Uh, so you got to ask yourself, what do these numbers mean? Uh, is 
No. Uh, okay, they are from Nate Silver's Bayesian model, which is not even, you know, which he changes every day. Uh, changes the model in which aren't Bayesian. Uh, so it's his numbers. How would you test whether he's accurate or not? The only way I could imagine doing that, uh, testing these, and I've talked with one of my statistician colleagues, we might actually do this. Uh, I think he had a student that I, ha I don't know whether he carried out, but we were talking about having a student tested in real time. And what I mean by testing in real time is we could treat these like stock market uh, numbers. How would you test whether the stock market was efficient? Well, you'd try to make money from it. Uh, if you had a uh, way of trading that multiplied your money by a lot, you could say those prices aren't very good. Uh, but you could also test these probabilities in the same way. You could... Um, uh, you could buy uh, Biden one day and sell him the next day. Uh, so obviously, if you had bought Biden um, at a low point there on in um, uh, the end of February, uh, <laughs> you could have sold him for a lot more uh, a few days later. Uh, so you need some, obviously you can't do that. It is not a fair test to, uh, you know, to, uh, decide how to buy and sell after the fact. But if you, if you had some, uh, strategy for doing it as you went along, I mean, you know, you might, uh, sort of buy the, uh, leader or the, you know, the first and sell them the second day. Uh, something like that. So there, you can imagine strategies for, uh, because these swings are so, you know, did, did the world really change that much? Uh, some people were saying that, uh, you know, we're, in fact, the common wisdom before this happened was that Biden would lose those early primaries and then win big and later ones. And so exactly what they were predicting happened, uh, but somehow when you had the in the to make it fun and interesting, they uh, seem to have uh, changed the probabilities and made it look very wild. Uh, so maybe there's some way that you could. Uh, anyway, that's what would be worth a try, and it seems like it's the only way to test whether these probabilities uh, are good. Would be to buy and sell them. Uh, as you go along. So that's the basic idea that you could test probability forecasts by um, betting. <clears throat> so let's go back to the sports example. Now, the interesting thing there is that uh, Nate Silver is constantly giving probabilities for sports events, and every day it's something different. So let's imagine, I'll leave Nate out of it, let's imagine we have a forecaster named Alice who announces probabilities for sports events. Uh, so maybe one day she gives the probabilities for winning for the players in a tennis tournament. The next day she gives probabilities for who's going to win, lose, or lose a soccer game. Next day she gives probabilities for the point spread in a cricket game. Uh, so how would we test Alice in that and my uh, suggestion is that we would test Alice by trying to make money at the odds uh, Alice is giving. Uh, and I, my last on this slide, my last statement is, can you think of it other way? I, I don't see what other way you would do it. So uh, this is my argument for kind of getting you into the uh, thought uh, that this makes sense. So what are we doing? Bob is going to test Alice. He's going to test Alice uh, by buying random variables for the expected values uh, calculated from Alice's uh, probabilities. Uh, and my idea is that if Bob starts with a dollar and doesn't risk more than that, uh, 
Uh, and after a certain, you know, after a year, Bob walks away with a hundred dollars and only risked a, risked a dollar, then Alice is going to be discredited. Uh, she may say she was unlucky, but she can't really claim that she was successful as a forecaster. So that's the only way you could test a probability forecaster. I claim when the forecaster is giving probabilities about lots of different things, uh, that, um, uh, to try to multiply the money you are risking. Now, it's important that you say how much you're risking and that you don't risk more than that. I mean, you don't have, the idea is you don't have an unlimited line of credit. You can't, after you're, after you started, you can't say, oh, now I'm going to go borrow, borrow some money. Uh, no, you got to say, this is how much I'm risking and I'm trying to multiply it. I've got one dollar, and I'm going to try to multiply that one dollar by ten, by five, by a hundred, uh, whatever it is. I'm trying to multiply this amount of money, and I'm not going to, you know, if I if my betting gets me to zero, that's the end. I can't make a bet that I might lose more than I have. At every step, I look at how much do I have left, or how much have I gained? How much is my? I start with this one dollar, and uh, what is left of it or how much have I made it into at a certain point? And at that point, I'm not allowed to make a bet that would risk more than what I have. That's the idea. I can't go, can't go bankrupt. Not uh, now, I want to point out, I have a box, this red box at the bottom, that Bob is not acting like a Bayesian. A lot of people, as soon as you talk betting, they say, well, that's Bayesian. Uh, no, uh, we aren't. Bob is really more of a frequentist. He wants us to, he wants the probabilities to work out. I mean, usually the frequentist is somebody who's saying the probabilities should be reflected in what happens. Uh, the word frequency doesn't quite fit because we're not betting on the same thing all the time. But still, it is uh, that spirit of frequentist, not the spirit of how, of what I believe. It doesn't matter whether Alice is saying what she believes, uh, those are her probabilities. What we want to know is, are they, are they fitting what happens in the world? And Bayesians also, Bayesians give probabilities for hypotheses. And so it's like, okay, you could ask the Bayesian to bet on the hypothesis, but that bet is never settled because we never know for sure whether the hypothesis is true or false. So uh, here, we're not betting on the hypotheses, we're betting on the outcomes, what's really settled. So the bets are settled. Uh, and we're using the, the outcome of the bet as our, and we're gonna use that instead of a p-value. So roughly speaking, if we multiply our $1 by 100, or whatever we bet, if we multiply it by, whatever money we're risking, if we multiply it by 100, that's like a p-value of, you could think of it provisionally to get started. You could think of like that as a p-value of one percent. Uh, that's kind of uh, the way we're thinking. So that's how we're going to replace p-values with betting outcomes. Uh, pause. Are there any questions so far in what I'm saying? Oh, hi, professor. I have a question. Uh, you said that if if it gets with one dollar and end up with like one hundred dollar, it's like p value of one percent. But I, sorry, I, I don't understand this con concept. I, sorry. Uh, don't understand the concept. Well, I mean, p value is very complicated, and this is something different. So I'm not saying it's the same thing, uh, but I'm saying you might think of it as similar amount of evidence it's just like a parameter to uh to show the uh, the, the possibility like well, because you know because there is not a rigid like definition for you yeah. there's not a um it's not the same definition as p-value no uh, P-value has got a very complicated definition. This is something of its own, which 
in my mind is simpler. Maybe it doesn't sound simpler to everyone, but the idea is just uh, the more you multiply the money your money by, the worse it is for the hypothesis. Okay, thank you. Uh, if the hypothesis, uh, I mean, it, the idea would be that when somebody is giving probabilities, what they mean by the probabilities is that you're not going to make money by betting at these odds. And if you do make money, uh, then that discredits the probabilities, says that's not a good hypothesis. And it, the more money you make, the more it discredits it. Now, but but I don't want to let you make money by, um, uh, you know, if you bet more money than you have, that's not fair. Um, most of our stock market geniuses get rich by betting somebody else's money. They say, okay, I will manage your money and, uh, um, we will split the profits. So, you know, when somebody makes a million dollars that way, <laughs> um, you know, they weren't really, really, you know, they were risking somebody else's money. So here you got to risk your own money. Um, I, but maybe I should pause to see if there was someone else that wants to argue with this a little bit or, or ask more. My next slide says that there's always the idea of the alternative hypothesis. Um, Bob can do this without saying there's an alternative hypothesis. He, he, maybe he doesn't think there is any good probabilities. Maybe he thinks that for these election predictions that he, he doesn't have, can bet against Alice's probabilities without having, having, having any probabilities of his own. Uh, that's a point I want to make. Uh, he, maybe he doesn't think there really are any good probabilities for the situation. Uh, he can still test Alice's. Another point is that he doesn't need to risk real money. He can bet with money. Uh, and because it's, he wants to make a point how to get rich. Another way of of making this point is that you could say uh, the the Alice is discredited when Bob multiplies the money he is risking by a lot. Uh, now Bob might start with a thousand dollars and try to multiply it by a lot, or he might start with one dollar and try to multiply it by a lot, or he could start with one penny and multiply it by a lot. For now. Nobody, even the homeless guy, cares very much about one penny. So, you know, it's not like you really have to risk anything serious to play this game. Uh, the, you know, if you multiply, your, if you take one penny and turn it into $5, that is spectacular. Uh, and it doesn't matter that uh, you didn't care about the penny, you know. Uh, you don't mind losing the penny, but still. Now, of course, that assumes that you can make fraction of a, you can make bets that are a fraction of a penny because you don't want to bet the whole penny right off. Uh, so instead you could, instead of betting with pennies, you could bet with play money. So, uh, and so it's just a game. You're using play money and you don't need to have anybody else risking money betting against you either. And Alice doesn't have to really risk her money. I mean, that's one thing my friends, I have some friends that kind of are in the same spirit as this, who uh, want to who interpret probability in terms of betting. Uh, and they say, you know, gamblers, when you give them a probability, you know, if you don't have money behind it, they say, well, you know, what's it mean? Uh, so Nate Silver is kind of in that position. He's giving these probabilities, but he's not betting. He's not offering bets. So uh, I think to here I'm saying what well, least we could imagine that he's offering bets and and if we multiply our money uh, betting against him, uh, that's making our point. He's not really offering bets, but he's risking his reputation as a forecaster. And if we could, you know, take his uh, offers and write a paper and claim that we had beat him, 
uh, without waiting to see the outcomes, we had beat him in real time. Then um, I think that would make that would. Make it. And also, I think in our ordinary language and talk, people sometimes say, um, you know, people say something and somebody else expresses their skepticism by offering to bet against them. Uh, that is sort of part of our common language, our common culture. Uh, so I think people understand the significance of betting games like this. Uh, so here are three examples of how people would naturally think about this, I think. Uh, one is that um, uh, if Bob makes money, even if, you know, we may start out, Alice may be an expert. Alice may know a lot about something. But if Bob makes money betting against her, and Bob is not an expert, then that would be a suggestion that, that Alice's expertise is really not doing much, is not helping predict what's going to happen. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes people have studied something a lot, they know all about it, but they still don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so if Bob, uh, you know, makes a lot of money, then we may say, well, Alice's additional information is not, that information is not valuable. Another situation is that Bob may know more than Alice. And in that case, Bob's winning, making a lot of money may be, in, may be evidence that Bob's extra information is relevant, but it does have something to do with what's going to happen. Um, now, if Bob doesn't make money, if Bob starts with a dollar, this was Nicole, uh, Nicole's example, what if Bob starts with a dollar and ends up with a dollar or less? Uh, then certainly that's no evidence against Alice. Uh, and if Bob knows a lot, if he's very clever and if he knows a lot of things, but still his betting hasn't made him any money against Alice, then in that case, uh, we may say that this is in Alice's favor. Alice has probably seemed to be pretty good because Bob can't make any money against her. Uh, because in a sense, that's what the probabilities are supposed to mean that you can't make money betting against them. So that kind of goes against Professor Creedy you could say, uh, but it it goes against Professor Creedy because we have this additional uh, uh, information that Bob is clever and knowledgeable. Uh, so uh, that would be like if we had a statistical test that we know is the best test. Uh, in that case, the failure of the test may say the probabilities are pretty good. Uh, so, um, so these are kind of commonsensical things, uh, about how, about betting, which I think don't depend upon, uh, sort of statistical training and definitions and so on. So I'm trying to convince you this is a natural idea, this testing by betting. Uh, uh now. Another um, nice thing about testing by betting is that Alice, you can, you can test Alice even when she announces less than probabilities. So what's an example? For example, a stock price uh, is not a full probability distribution for tomorrow's price. Today's price is not a probability distribution for tomorrow's price. It's just people think if it's a if today's price is if the market is efficient, then today's price should be like the expected value of tomorrow's price. Which means that by buying and selling at today's price, you shouldn't systematically be able to make money by selling or buying tomorrow. You shouldn't be able to make money by buying today and selling tomorrow or vice versa. Uh, so that's a way of testing by betting. You could. You could test if Alice is giving a earnings forecast, you could take that as the price of the actual earnings 
uh, that come out the following months or week. Uh, so if um, Alice systematically, if Alice is a uh, analyst who makes earnings forecasts and actually gives a number every time, then you could, and you thought Alice was, Alice's numbers are always too optimistic, then you could make money by selling at Alice's price and buying and then buying back at the actual price. Uh, or is it, yeah, no, buying at Alice's price and selling at the actual price if she's optimistic or vice versa if she's pessimistic. So if you think the earnings forecast is not it, you could test earnings forecasters in that way if they gave precise forecasts. Uh, and a stock price is like a precise forecast. So this is a way of, this idea of testing by betting applies to testing the efficiency of a market. Uh, or testing how good earnings uh, analysts are. And we do that in the uh, in our book, Game Theoretic Foundations for Probability and Finance, uh, published last year, uh, we show how you can use this idea to test market efficiency. Uh, and um, that means that you're, the definition of market efficiency is that people won't make money by testing, by betting. And from that, uh, I see I don't have it on my last bullet. I don't have the uh, closing parenthesis. But from that, we can derive properties of market prices, like the fact that there's an equity premium, like the fluctuation follows the square root of, uh, of time. Uh, you know, the annual changes on average are 12 times the daily changes and so on. Uh, we can derive those just from our testing by betting idea. So it's a way of, uh, in our book, we actually have a version of what the mathematicians call the stochastic calculus that we teach to the MQF students. Uh, they, you know, uh, they, their theory, the MQF, uh, well, the, all these uh, stochastic calculus books assume that uh, market prices follow a certain probability distribution and derive things from that, uh, we get some of the same results. Uh, in fact, practic in, in practice, all the same results we get by from our definition of market efficiency as the inability of um, a better to make money from the market. So, uh, this is beginning to get some attention from the people that, uh, from the experts in this field. So we're very happy about that. Yeah, uh, uh, there's a there's an author, Professor Karatsas at Columbia, is the author of some of the standard textbooks on stochastic calculus. Very nice blurb that is on the back of our book. Oh, let me give it an example. To show what I mean, uh, let's say that Alice, the first week, she gives probabilities for who will win in a tournament, tournament say Wimbledon. So for every, every person in the tournament, she gives a probability this person will win. Uh, the probability is all adding up to one. Now, Bob has $100. So, for example, here's what he could do. He could buy the age of the Wimbledon win, uh, winner. Let's say that according to Alice's probabilities, the expected value, uh, you know, every person, every player, we know their age. So, from the probabilities, we could calculate the expected value of the winner's age. And let's say that's 28. So, okay, uh, Bob um, could say, okay, I'll buy the age of the winner for $28. So he pays $28 and he gets back the age of the winner. Now it turns out, let's say the winner turns out to be 25. So, so Bob has lost $3. Now he has $97. Uh, so maybe uh, the next, um, uh, so he has $97 left. And let's say that um, uh, uh, 
uh, Bob uh, pays that $97, uh, let's say that um, uh, the next bet is about whether Madrid or Barcelona will win the soccer game. Uh, so let's say that um, Alice gives a probability of 97% for Barcelona winning. That means that if, if Bob pays $97, he'll get back 100. But if, it's a, if uh, Madrid loses, uh, well, actually, Alice has said that uh, the probability is 97%. Uh, that Barcelona will win or it'll be a tie, and only a 3% uh, probability of Madrid winning. So Bob takes all of his $97 and he bets on Barcelona winning, uh, which is, you know, he's, he's risked his whole $97. He's only going to get back $100 if it goes his way, if Barcelona wins or ties. But in fact, Madrid wins, so he loses the $97. He has zero. Now, by our, Bob cannot say, okay, now I, well, I've, I started with $100, but now I'm going to put uh, five more dollars in the pot. No, no. Bob cannot put more money in the pot. He cannot borrow money. Uh, he said, I am risking $100, and he's trying to multiply that $100. He's not allowed to go get more money when things don't go his way. Uh, if you do it that way, it's not fair. Our theory says you got to take the money you have and try to multiply it uh, by a large factor. If you allow him to borrow money, the theory doesn't work. And I'll explain that a little more later. Uh, you know, um, you just keep risking more and more money. That's called call in, in gambling. That's called calling playing a martingale or going martingaling a very important concept. Uh, uh, okay. So I think this is getting a little bit detailed now, and maybe you didn't follow everything I said. So please ask me if there's something that you don't quite understand. Uh, and if you understand everything, tell me whether you ever heard the word martingale before. Jumi says, yes. Uh, Nicole said, no, she has not heard the word martingale. Uh, there's a no. These go so fast. There's a no. No. Most people have not heard the word martingale. So uh, while I was in Italy, I was just telling Miklos that I just came back from Italy uh, three weeks ago. So we're out of quarantine. Uh, but while I was in Italy, I was working on a uh, paper about martingales, another historical paper. Uh, it was very important in the development of probability theory was the idea of a martingale. Um, so a martingale is basically the, um, it's an important idea in probability, in advanced probability theory now. But originally, a martingale was a strategy for trying to make money in a game. Uh, but uh, the most famous martingales are ones where you just bet more and more. You know, if you lose, then you double your money. So you try to win it all back. If you lose again, you double your money again. Uh, you double the bet. If you lose again, you make a bet that's double that. And you just keep going, and eventually you're going to win. Um, but you know the problem is you might run out of money before you um, before you win. So that idea of doubling your money all the time was originally called a martingale, uh, and it was probably the name came from um, from a town in France uh, where people were very wild. And they gambled in a wild way. So that's a martingale. Uh, take off the ing there, martingaling I have down here. Uh, do you see my cursor when you when I share the screen? 
Uh, yes, the answer is yes. So my cursor is down here at the bottom. Go Martin Galing. Take off the ing and put an e there. That's the word martingale. So, uh, did you understand the concept here of how you're going to uh, bet, uh, test by betting, test Alice by betting? Any questions about it? I'm going to say they do understand. So Nicole says yes. So I got one yes. Okay. Now, here is uh, a famous, I said I would explain the analogy with p-values a little bit. And here is uh, an explanation. This is a famous theorem by a mathematician named Markov. Sort of Markov chains or Markov processes. Andrei Markov was a Russian mathematician who taught probability in St. Petersburg. Uh, at the University of St. Petersburg, Markov taught the probability course. And he wrote up his notes and published them as a book in 1900. And in that book, he included this theorem, which we call Markov's inequality. And it says that if capital Z is a non-negative random variable with expected value mu, then the probability that Z is going to come out more than K times mu is less than or equal to 1 over K. So mu in this betting idea, the expected value is the price you pay. So you're pay paying mu to get Z back. So this says the probability that you get back 100 times what you pay is less than or equal to 1%. So that's why multiplying your money by 100 is like a p-value of 1%. The probability of it happening is 1% or less. Uh, the probability of multiplying your money by 1,000 is less than 1 in 1,000. The probability of multiplying your money by 5 is less than uh, one-fifth or 20 percent. Now, you notice that Z is, the theorem says Z has got to be non-negative. That means no matter what happens, your payoff is not going to be negative. It's going to be the smallest it can be is zero. That means that all you're risking is mu. All you're risking is what you paid. Uh, you, um, uh, uh, you aren't allowed to buy an outcome that might be negative because that means that in addition to what you paid to buy it, you would be risking what you owed if it comes out negative. Uh, so as long as that's why that you aren't allowed to risk more than some amount you start with, you've got to say what the amount is you're risking. That's mute. So if you have a strategy for betting in a uh, game where you know where where the your opponent is going to be giving probabilities for things one after another, if you have some strategy for betting, then your final outcome is a random variable. And if you don't risk more than you started with, uh, then that's the price you paid, uh, and uh, that's like mu. So this is the intuition, but you can actually, uh, that's Markov's inequality. Now, the intuition that I am using about testing by betting is really more general than that because I, Bob, when he starts out, doesn't even know what Alice is going to give probabilities for. So Bob doesn't have necessarily a strategy at the outset. But still, intuitively, uh, 
uh, he can disc so he's not necessarily discrediting a probability distribution. Here, we've got some probability distribution. That's the, the bold face capital P is a probability distribution. It's like it's all there at the beginning. These are the probabilities for what's going to be happening. Now, uh, Alice is not a probability distribution. Alice is kind of making things up as she goes along. Uh, Nate Silver certainly is making things up as he goes along. Uh, you know, deciding the probability for this, the probability for that. Right now, as Miklo said, he's out of business because nobody's playing any sports. Uh, but as long as he was in business, he could make it up as he went along. So the, my in, intuition is that we can generalize this idea behind Markov's inequality. Uh, and um, so this is a, it's not a definite, it's a new way of thinking about probability. It's a very general, a more general way than the textbooks. In the textbooks, you always have some probability distribution. In the textbooks, I'll try to slow down. In the textbooks, uh, you have some probability distribution at the beginning, and this is it. And uh, here we're saying that the probability forecaster might be like Nate Silver giving probabilities for sports events, or might be like the National Hurricane Center giving probabilities for hurricanes. Uh, at the beginning of the season, we don't know what hurricanes are going to come along. Uh, the, they don't have a strategy for how they're going to do it. They make it up as they go along, but we could still say, how good a job are they doing? And we could test them by betting against those probabilities. That's the idea. Uh, so that's how this is like P values, not exactly like, not not the same thing as a p-value, but it's a similar idea. And I, and in some sense, in my mind, I'm, I worked with it so long. I think it's a simpler idea. Uh, it's an idea, you know, that people have already a little bit. Uh, uh, I don't know if other languages have the same terminology, but the same way of talking, but in English, when I was a kid, there's this phrase, put your money where your mouth is. Somebody thinks, uh, says something is going to happen or that something is true. Uh, well, hey, I'll bet against you. Put up your money. Uh, so it's a way of testing somebody's knowledge is uh, betting. Is this, is there a, is there a phrase like this in Chinese? Put your money where your mouth is. Is that a saying in Chinese? Ning Wang says, I don't know. Not, you're not familiar with it. Uh, anyone else? Uh, how do you, is there a way? Well, I, my native in, uh, language is Korean, but I don't think we have those kind of phrases, but. Oh. And, but it's, I mean, but it's natural that if there's something about it and are you, get, are you sure? You can also say that, oh, can you bet your money? You sure that much? Maybe we don't have those I, like sentence. I see. I see. Okay. So that's uh, anybody else have a comment about that? Uh, okay. Well, my last uh, the bottom of this slide. Um, I mentioned that if you look at there's a famous in. Um, Probably you have studied enough finance to study the papers by Fama, F-A-M-A. Uh, so Fama, starting in the 1960s and 70s, uh, published papers about testing market efficiency by portfolios uh, that tried to make money. Uh, the notion of market efficiency is that you shouldn't be able to make money betting against the market. And so you would form portfolios that went short in certain stocks and long in other stocks. Uh, so in a sense, they were testing by betting. Uh, but they didn't do it this way. They didn't do it this way because they didn't control the total you risked. They didn't say, okay, this is how much we're going to risk. 
uh, and uh, we're going to see if we can multiply our money. That's not the way they did it. Uh, so this is kind of a new way of testing and uh, even defining market efficiency. Uh, and it has some advantages over, uh, I don't want to make this into a lecture on market efficiency, but um, uh, what is the famous term, uh, the, um, uh, the, <clears throat> the literature on market efficiency is kind of disappointing because they finally decided they didn't know how to test it. They had what they called the joint hypothesis problem. Uh, tell me whether you know this phrase in finance theory, the joint hypothesis problem. Uh, Jumi, do you know that phrase, the joint hypothesis problem? I've heard of that, but um, I don't, sorry. If you could explain again, that would be great. Let me ask if anybody else can explain it. Anybody explain what the joint hypothesis problem is? I wrote it. I wrote the words at the bottom of the slide in case uh, who is here. Let's see. Haxin says never heard. Hanchi. Okay, market efficiency implies, yes, but uh, have you heard the term joint hypothesis problem? Kathy says no. Anchi says he finds it from Google. <laughs> uh, the problem of testing is difficult or even impossible. That's what Google says, okay. Um, uh, King Wang says he's Googling it. Okay, so you're learning about it as we go. Marcelo, Marcelo, have you heard about this term, the joint hypothesis problem? No. Okay, what is the joint hypothesis problem? The joint hypothesis problem is that when people say the market is efficient, they're basically saying the stock prices are the correct expected value but they are not giving a whole probability distribution. I'm giving you a simple version of it. It's more complicated, but a simple version is that all the stock price tells is the expected value. It's not giving you the whole joint distribution. So you don't really know the probabilities. So you have to add a model that tells what the probabilities are and test that model. When you do that, you're not just testing the efficiency, you're testing the whole model. And it's a joint hypothesis between the model and the efficiency. So the result is, is this concept of uh, market efficiency that the literature has concluded. It's an important concept. It's fundamental to finance, but you can't test it. Uh, that's kind of, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm a little, you know, I'm not an economist, so I can make fun of them. Uh, but that's kind of a problem of modern economics with all these probabilities that you get. They, you know, they won't, they won't really give you any way to test anything. Uh, but here, you know, you don't need any problem. You don't need any model. You just take what is the stock prices say and try to make money at those prices. Uh, or at least theoretically make money. There's a problem of transaction costs and all that. There's a problem that if you go short, then theoretically you could lose an unlimited amount of money. So you could make some assumption about how much the stock market is going to go down in one day. Hey, that's dangerous too. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, at least this gives us a way that in theory, at least we could uh, test, or at least we could test with play money uh, without a joint hypothesis. So this, uh, this is all I'll say about market efficiency, but I just want to say that this theory something to say about that uh, topic here and see if I can um, testing by betting for statistics. Now I'm going to take this idea of testing by betting and I'm going to relate it more. Uh, I was explaining how we could test anybody's probabilities for betting. Excuse me. We could bet 
We can test anybody's probabilities by betting. And now I'm going to focus on the statistical models. Uh, how do we test statistical models by betting? So we have a statistical model called a, a this probability distribution is our statistical model. Let's make it simple. We won't have parameters in it. Uh, just say the, the the probability model says these are the probabilities, capital P. Uh, and it's the probabilities for how capital Y will come out. And we're going to observe capital Y and use the result little y to test P. So what is the conventional way of doing it? The conventional way is to choose a significance level, say 5%. We call the significance level alpha, but we're going to take it to be 5% most of the time. And then we're going to choose a critical region, a set of values of little y that has probability 5% under P, and we're going to reject P if y is in E. So this is a recipe for hypothesis testing, which I think you learned in your textbooks. Am I right? Does this look familiar to you? Um, uh, Nicole, does this look like what you saw in your textbooks? Yes. Uh, Muhammad, does this look like what you saw? Mohammed there, Mohammed Tahal Afzal. He says, yes, professor, I see. Okay, so that looks uh, familiar. Uh, so we could actually make that a betting interpretation. If you've chosen uh, this E, that has probably 5% are happening, you could, you could interpret that as a bet. You could say, okay, I'm going to pay $1 uh, that I'll lose if he doesn't happen, but if he happens, I get back $20. So when he happens, we say an event of small probability happens, so P is discredited. But we could also make it into a bet. We could say we're going to bet on E happening because we don't believe P. We don't believe P, so we're going to bet against it. We're going to bet $1 that E will happen and get back $20. Or we can bet $0.05 cents and get back $1. Either way, we multiply our money by 20. So we bet that we've discredited P by betting our money by a large factor. And we say, well, what better evidence could you have against a hypothesis than that? You picked out an event that the hypothesis said had small probability. You bet on that event and you won and you multiplied your money by a lot because the probability was very small. According to the hypothesis, the hypothesis capital P said the probability for that is very small. It's only 5%. So you said, oh yeah, I think it's going to happen. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you bet on it. It does happen. You multiply your money by a lot. Uh, you can say, you know, well, look, you're not a very good, that probability is not very good. I can beat it. That's the basic idea. So you take the basic way of that you're taught how to test hypotheses and we translate it into this betting interpretation. So we can do what they do. I mean, I can do my betting interpretation can do uh, just take the usual way and uh, and um, duplicate it. Now, of course, P values come in because people want to do more than that. They want more, they want more than just a single bet or a single small probability event. They want to measure the strength of the evidence. So instead of choosing a single alpha, this is where you get p-values. Instead of choosing a single alpha, what they do is they use a test statistic, define a test for every alpha. And then the p-value is the smallest alpha for which the test rejects. So it's the, it's the error probability for which the confidence interval just doesn't quite cover zero or the null hypothesis. The smallest alpha for which the test rejects. And the smaller the p-value, the more evidence there is against p. 
So this is one way of under another way of understanding where p values come from. But as I have been complaining, this is too complicated. It's too complicated. So what I want instead is uh, I want to make a single bet. Instead of a whole set of tests, I want just one test, a single bet. But my single bet is not where you choose one alpha of 5% and make a 20 to 1 bet. Uh, the single bet is where you buy an outcome that could have different values. So that's like buying the stock today and selling it tomorrow. Uh, you might make $1, you might lose $1. Uh, you might uh, make more than that or lose more than that. You might come out even. It's not all or nothing. Uh, so uh, instead of an all or nothing, you uh, make this bet that is really gives an outcome that's a function of Y. So the bet is called is capital S here. Oops, it is. Uh, the bet is a function of Y. Say S of Y. Ooh, I I uh, have to be careful here. So you're going to bet one dollar instead, of, but instead of paying one dollar for all or nothing and getting back either zero or twenty. I'm going to pay $1 uh, and get back uh, S. So uh, if I'm paying $1, that means I'm paying the expected value for S. So that's this. Um, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know how to control my own computer very well. I want to get my cursor back. Both There, there it is. Uh, so I'm going to choose a payoff that has expected value 1 and buy it. $1 and get back S of Y dollars. So S of Y is the factor you multiply your money by, and I call it a betting score outcome. So I said I'm going to replace P values by betting outcomes. I could also say betting scores. I'm going to call this the betting score. And instead of saying a P value is small, I'm going to say the betting score is big. So it's like a p-value in that it measures the strength of evidence. But it measured is it by whether it's big. Big means more evidence in this case instead of uh, small meaning more evidence in the case of uh, p-value. So this is the basic notion of testing by betting uh, as applied when we apply it to a statistical model. Remember, I started out by trying to show you how general it is. You could you could even uh, bet against people giving probabilities like the Hurricane National Weather Service or you know National Hurricane Center or the uh, or Nate Silver's uh, sports probabilities. Uh, but now we're focused on the on the more familiar case of a statistical model. So I am uh, saying this is how we would uh, test the statistical model. Um, so, are there any questions about where we are here? Uh, Nicole, are, is this clear? Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's very clear. Okay. Let me ask one other person who else is here. Uh, um, who else is with us still? Kathy, is this clear to you? to me. Okay, so we're all, everybody's okay. Okay, so, uh, so the blue here is what I already said. We're going to choose a random variable with expected value one, pay one dollar and get back that payoff. And the amount we get back is the betting score. Now, if you don't like expected value one, you could choose the whole point is how much you multiply the amount you pay. So if instead of buying a score that instead of buying something that is has expected value one, you could you could buy something that has a different expected value as long as it's positive. 
S has to be non-negative. Uh, so in that case, you would just divide, you would take, uh, there's my cursor. You would take the bidding score would be S of Y divided by its expected value. It's how much you've multiplied the money you paid. Uh, but for simplicity, I will make this assumption the expected value is one. Did I say non-negative? Let me go back to the previous page. Uh, make a bet Y. I didn't say non-negative. I should have said that. I should have said that Y can pay many different amounts, but they're all non-negative. That's important. Should change this slide so it says that. Uh, the betting score doesn't change when we multiply S by a positive constant. To multiply S by a constant, uh, you multiply its expected value by a constant, so the ratio S divided by the expected value doesn't change. So as I was saying, you could bet so little that you wouldn't care uh, if you lost that price you paid or whether or not you got back S of Y, you could, you know, you could multiply it by a constant that's so little that both those numbers are negligible. So this is not a decision theory. This isn't about deciding how to uh, make decisions involving amounts of money that you care about. It's just a game. You're just, or, or you can just play with, you can just use play money. Uh, the point is that you're playing a game to try to show, uh, to try to tell the probabilities aren't good probabilities. Uh, that's the idea. So it's not decision theory. People want to, as soon as I start to talk about betting, people want to do decision theory. And that's not the story here. So the betting score is the factor by which I multiply my money. The factor by which I multiply the money I risk. Large betting score is the best evidence I can have against the probability model. Now, you could always say, okay, you multiply your money by a million. Maybe you were just lucky. It was a one in a million chance. You were just lucky. Um, uh, that happens. Uh, but, you know, you're always going to have that issue in statistical testing or in life. Uh, we can never be completely sure. Uh, uh, there is uncertainty, and everybody understands that. So I gave a quote earlier that one of my statistician colleagues said that in order to deal better with this whole EP value problem, we have to learn to manage uncertainty, to accept uncertainty. And so one of my claims is that people understand that when you're talking about betting. They understand the uncertainty. They understand that no matter how good the evidence is, it might be wrong. Uh, maybe you're just lucky. Uh, now I want to understand something, uh, get into something called a likelihood ratio. Uh, and this is a uh, concept from statistics that may or may not, if you've taken, if you studied Bayes, I think some of you already know about likelihood ratios. Um, let me ask Marcelo, have, do you know about, li have you studied the likelihood ratios? Yes, I heard it. Uh, Mohammed, have you studied likelihood ratios? I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I want to get a concept. I think in the past, uh, Mohammed says. Um, uh, King Huang, have you studied likelihood ratios? No, I don't think so. No, so I heard of that, but I'm not very familiar with this. Okay, okay. So likelihood ratios, is, thank you for your responses. Likelihood ratios are something uh, that people talk about in STAT, and some of them, some of the people think likelihood ratios are better than p-values. Uh, and those people are should be pleased by what I'm doing now, because it turns out uh, that a betting score is a likelihood ratio. So it actually is not so strange. Uh, it's something that Bayesians already use and that some people that aren't Bayesians use. So 
So let's go through this. We're now getting it into a little bit of math. So what did I say a bet is? A bet is an out is a is a random variable capital S that is a function of y. It's non-negative. I didn't have that in my slide, but I was reminding you it has to be non-negative. And its expected value is supposed to be one. Uh, now let's write that out. Expected value one. How do you calculate the expected value? Uh, I'm not assuming I'm not using integrals here. I'm not going to do continuous case. I'll just keep it simple by being discrete. So when you have a discrete random variable, you calculate its expected value by taking the possible values, multiplying them by their probabilities and adding them up. And that's what this formula says. For all the possible values, little y, we add up over all those values, little y, whatever they are, we add up the probability of little y times the outcome we get, if little y is the answer. And that's the expected value. So the assumption is that expected value is one, right? So that's the def that's, that's just, this is just a way of writing out the idea that the expected value is one, right there. So my cursor is expected value one. Now, think about what you get if you take the function s and multiply it times the function y. Excuse me, start over. You take the function s and the function p and multiply them together. That gives s times p, that's a new function. Now, what this says is that the values of that new function add up to one. And they're non-negative because P is a probability. It's non-negative. Uh, probabilities can't be negative. And S, we assumed, is non-negative. So S times P is non-negative. So these are non-negative numbers adding up to one. That's what a probability solution is. If you have non-negative numbers for the different outcomes adding up to one, that's a probability distribution for them. So P was a probability distribution and S times P is also. So it means that your bet, my bet S is like a new probability distribution. It's an alternative probability distribution. So let's call that Q. So when you were giving a bet, when you decided how to bet, you were actually choosing an alternative probability distribution. Maybe you didn't know it, maybe you didn't think about it, but you were. And that new probability distribution is given by this formula, Q is equal to S times P. Now, if we divide both sides by P, we get that S is equal to Q divided by P. Uh, and that is what the statisticians call a likelihood ratio. When you take one probability distribution's probability for the outcome and divide it by the other probability distributions for the outcome, uh, probability for the outcome, that's a likelihood ratio. So the bet was actually a likelihood ratio. Uh, and it's just a, 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 a matter of fact that the expected value of a likelihood ratio is one. Uh, so somehow, uh, um, choosing a bet is the same as choosing an alternative probability distribution in a way. And the uh, alternative probability distribution and the and the bet is the ratio of the two. It's the likelihood ratio. Okay, so this is some very simple theory. Uh, are you with me? Is there are there any questions about this? Now the Bayesians use likelihood ratios. They take the prior probabilities and multiply them by the likelihoods. They call the probability that you that the Probability, the probability that the um, uh, the probability that the um, hypothesis p gives to the actual outcome is called the likelihood of p. So this is the ratio of two likelihoods, and the Bayesian model says take the prior odds and multiply them by the likelihood ratio and get you get the posterior odds for the hypotheses. 
but we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not doing Bayes. It's not Bayesian. We don't have probabilities for the hype. We don't have prior probabilities. Uh, we're just uh, betting against the hypothesis. Okay. So, uh, so I'm just um, repeating what I've said in a sense with these words uh, that my bet S defines an alternative hypothesis, even if I didn't think about it. Maybe I didn't think about it. Maybe I didn't know the theory. Maybe I didn't know the theory I was just explaining to you. Maybe uh, that product is too hard to calculate. It's possible in complicated cases that I can't make any sense of it. It's too hard to calculate. So I'm not necessarily uh, thinking in terms of the alternative. I might have just said, I don't know what the probabilities are. I don't even, I don't even have to because I could bet against the hypothesis without even having an all believing. I don't even have to believe there are better probabilities. I just say, I think there's a way I can beat Alice. Uh, so, uh, but in fact, it defines a uh, alternative hypothesis. And I explained that if you do have a alternative distribution Q, and you form that, that ratio Q over P, that is a bet. It does have expected value one. So you can prove it as expected value one by doing a calculation. Uh, you take the values of the ratio, multiply it by the probabilities, that would give the expected value of the ratio. And of course the P's cancel out, so you just have the sum of the Q's, and if the Q is a probability distribution, that adds up to one. So, a likelihood ratio is a bet with expected value one. And if you start with a bet with expected value one, you get a likelihood ratio. Now, there is a uh, question here at the bottom. Suppose, suppose I like Q. Do I have any reason to choose Q over P as my bet against P? Is that a natural thing to do? Um, uh, the way I presented this, I probably have you thinking, okay, that's natural. So let's say I didn't start with a bet. Let's say instead I started with an alternative. I said, Alice says it's P, but I think it's Q. In that case, should I choose Q or P as my bet? That's a question. And uh, the way I present things, it makes it sound like, yeah, that's- I'm not sure if it's a right uh, example, but when you uh, thinking about the stock market, you short uh, stock market, a stock, um, sorry, you short the stock, which you think that it will uh, decrease the value in the future? Or maybe, can you be the like, I don't know, can you be the example of it? Well, the stock, that's a good question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, the, this, where I am now, the stock market is not an example of what I'm doing now because the stock market doesn't tell you a whole probability distribution. When I was talking about the stock market, I was trying to show you how general my approach of testing by betting is, that it applies even to the stock market. But then I switched gears. Then I said, wait a minute. Now I'm going to do testing by betting for statisticians. So I stopped doing the stock market. I stopped doing Nate Silver and sports betting and all that. I said, now I'm going to study a situation where we have a statistical model. And the statistical model is given and I'm going to bet against it. So in a sense, I'm now doing a special case that corresponds to the uh, papers in the accounting review and the papers in psychology journals and medical statistics where people have a statistical model. We're not doing hurricane forecasting. We're not doing sports betting. We're doing a statistical model. Uh, we're not doing the stock market. 
So now we have a statistical model and somebody has a probability distribution and we're betting against it. A whole probability distribution, not just a, not just a stock price. A stock price is like just an expected value, not a whole probability distribution. I'm saying somebody has a whole probability distribution and we're betting against it. Uh, this P over Q business, I can only do that if I've got a whole P. Uh, I've got to have a P that tells me probabilities for every uh, Y. Then I can choose a Q uh, that also has probabilities for every Y and uh, or I can choose a Q and I can take the ratio, but if I don't have a whole P, I can't do that. Does that respond, does that address your thought? Yeah, I understand. But some of the case, like, I don't know, like Brian, Brian motion has the whole uh, distribution. I mean, it doesn't really detect accurately the stock market, but there are some of the, like people propose some of the like uh, probably did that uh, distribution to detect the stock market prices. So I thought uh, stock market is also part of considered to have underlying probability distribution but yeah but you, you well, yes in that case in that case if we had you know if we had somebody who was defending a probability model for the stock market then we could use this idea to bet against them that's correct i understood yep thank you okay uh so uh the Thank you for the question. Um, uh, now, I was asking here, if we like Q, if somebody said P, I like Q better, should I use Q over P as my bet? Now, the fact is that that's not what statisticians usually do. They do because they usually do these all or nothing bets. So instead of choosing Q over P, they make an all or nothing bet. Uh, and they use Q to choose that all or nothing bet, but they don't take, they don't use Q over P. Instead, they choose a, remember the all or nothing bets that statisticians usually use. Here, the all or nothing bet is, um, or nothing bad is you choose some E and uh, uh, that has probably 5%. So you could choose the E that has the highest values of Q over P. But, and then you could bet on that, that all or nothing bet. But it's not the same as betting on, is taking Q over P as your bet. Uh, so what I have here in mind, starting with Q and choosing P, is not what statisticians usually do that again. You say P, and I think Q is better. I'm a statistician. I don't usually choose my bet as Q or P. Instead, I do an all or nothing bet. You know, so uh, this is something different. So why do I think this is a good idea instead of doing what statisticians usually do? And the answer has to do with multiple testing. Is it almost 5.30? My uh, hello. Uh, yes, yes. And uh, it's just that time passes when you're having fun. Yes, I was slowed down so much uh, that I didn't get to, wow. Um, how many slides do I have left? Um, well, okay, do I, well, I guess some of the students may need to go, but um, uh, let me go on for 10 minutes. Uh, if you, uh, I, didn't, I was looking at my clock and watch and say, how much time do I have left? And I, <laughs> 13 minutes, 13 minutes. Okay. Uh, so uh, the end of my question is that if I believe Q, then the nice thing about Q over P is that I'm maximizing the logarithm of my payoff. 
maximizing, there's a mathematical theorem that says that by choosing Q or P as my bet, I'm not maximizing the expected value of my payoff, but I'm maxing, maximizing the expected value of the logarithm of my payoff. And why would I want to do that? Well, this is an idea that has been used in gambling theory, information theory, finance theory, and machine learning, but it's not been used in stat. And the idea is uh, that uh, if you if you, you want to maximize the logarithm, you're going to do this more than once. If you're doing a whole series of betting, uh, then the logarithm is going to be the rate of growth of uh, maximizing the logarithm is going to maximize the rate of growth of your capital. Uh, so instead of uh, uh, taking the expected value of your payoff, you want to maximize the expected value of the logarithm of your payoff. Okay, we have spent a lot of time discussing, but that is the basic idea here. And that has behind it the idea that maybe, if you are serious about a hypothesis, here's one of the problems of the literature and social science, including accounting, is that people only test a hypothesis once. As soon as you've tested a hypothesis, uh, the journal publisher won't let you test it again. It won't let the next guy test it. Now in physics or chemistry, if you do an experiment, the other lab does it too, and they also publish it because nobody wants to believe it if it just happened once. But somehow in social science, including accounting and finance, there's this idea that, oh, we just do it once and we can, do, can't, we can't publish that again. We're always looking for something we can't, we can't, we can't check what somebody else uh, did. But here the idea is if you have a probability distribution that, that is going to make one prediction, it should make it the next time and you should test it again. So what you really want to maximize, what you really want to do is, is say, okay, this time I tested it, I multiplied by, by a little bit. Next month, somebody else should test it, and they should take that same money and multiply it by more. And to show the hypothesis is really bad, we should have multiple people testing and multiple research teams testing it over time and building up that betting score. And you're going to build that betting score up by multiple because, uh, you know, it's, if it's only been tested once, then it's not fair that, you know, the other guy should be able to take the money that's already been accumulated and try to make that bigger. That's the idea. Uh, so you're really not, you really don't want to look at the average of how much people multiply. You want to look at an average of p-values. This is a way of, of doing multiple testing, a way of just doing a test of multiply uh, and when you do that, oh, uh, another concept that, so I'm going to just quickly tell you what the rest of the lecture is about. Uh, I haven't mentioned power yet. The usual theory of uh, statistics, people's, and you don't see it in accounting. The accounting, accounting review, you hardly ever see the word power. Uh, but statisticians teach that you want to only do a test of power. Uh, and they teach that, well, maybe there, maybe if you have a test that is powerful, uh, then uh, when the null hypothesis is not rejected, maybe that's evidence for the null hypothesis, only if the test has large power. Uh, this hardly ever comes up in... Um, uh, um, the accounting literature or in social science, how many of the students have studied a stack course where you learned about power? Uh, I will pause for a minute to see. Somebody give me a yes or no. Nicole, did you study power? I, I think so, but I'm not sure if uh, is this the power that I know. So maybe I... So, I yeah, so maybe you remember, I think that's the way most of our students uh, are, that, oh, maybe, heard of that, but it doesn't show up. You don't study it when you study accounting articles because people aren't using it. So here, there is an idea of power because the reason why the statisticians, you know, in practice, 
you aren't using power is because nobody says exactly what the alternative hypothesis is. Maybe, you know, it's like they haven't given that interval that Professor Creedy is asking for, that statistically, that minimum practical significant difference. They haven't given that. So it's like they haven't given an alternative. So here, the alternative is forced on you. As soon as you make the test, the bet, there is an alternative. So you can't hide it. Uh, and I call that alternative the, I call that um, Q, I call it the implied the implied alternative. So there's an implied alternative and the expected value of the log of your, uh, of your test tells you how much under the alternative, how much you expect to multiply your money. Uh, so uh, this is what a, t a study would look like doing it my way. Uh, the proposed study, you would say, here's the proposed study. I have the initially unknown outcome Y the probability distribution, capital P, the non-negative uh, bet, S, that defines an implied alternative, Q, and because Q is there, you can use it to calculate basically how much money you expect to make if you believe Q. If you believe Q, you expect the logarithm of your bet to come out equal to about its expected value, and so the exponent of that, since you take the logarithm, you would take the exponent to convert back. So that's how much you expect you to multiply your money, the implied target. So the implied target tells how much you're expecting to multiply your money. So if your study says that you expect to multiply your money by 100, that looks like a good test. Let's see what happens. Uh, and if you don't multiply your money by then maybe the null hypothesis is pretty good. If you only multiply your money by, you know, if you expect to multiply your money by 100, but you only multiply your money by one and a half, uh, that's no good. So basically you can evaluate how good the study is before you do it. You then get the actual value and then you get the, uh, the betting score. So this kind of idea of testing and betting would force the forces the uh, author of the study to say in advance because you got to say what the bet is in advance. You can't do the you can't look at the data and then say, oh, I want to do this. No, you've got to do the whole idea of betting says you've got to bet in it before you see the outcome. Uh, so you've got to design the study. Say this is my study, and as soon as you've done that, you've got an alternative, which is not. That's the problem in a sense that Professor Creedy is pointing to is that the accounting literature does not force you to say what the alternative is. Here, you are, your very bet forces you to. And so I have a number of examples uh, and I changed this a little bit. Uh, so let me just conclude um, with this. Most of the problems with p-values are one of three kinds. Uh, one kind is number one is statistically and practically significant, but the test is so noisy that you can't conclude anything. This is the case where the result may be significant, but it's not only unlikely under the null hypothesis, it's also unlikely under any reasonable alternative hypothesis. So you don't really have anything. A lot in psychology that don't pan out, get published, are like this. Uh, so this is kind of the, what has gotten the most attention. The second one, which is more unusual, is that you have a test with a, with a uh, conventional significance level, like 5%, a very high power, so according to the statisticians, it's good, uh, but the outcome is borderline. Uh, and even though you get a significant result, the uh, likelihood ratio doesn't look good and the Bayesian will disagree. Uh, this is less common than number one, really is one reason why power is not used very much because it can have these paradoxical situations. The third value is the one that Creedy was concerned about where a high value is interpreted as evidence for the null hypothesis. 
And even though theoretical statisticians say never do that, uh, you see this in areas of application. And uh, my slides, this is a version of the, my slides. These last slides are ones that I added and just sent to EJ uh, and asked them to distribute to you. So she'll make this available, I think. Okay. 